the theme is design in time. Uh, and I'm talking about time in terms of both the medium and using the kind of reference to it with a sense of urgency. So to begin with, uh, time is not um, just a measure of duration. Uh, things emerge and transform and decay in time. So time, in essence, is change. And everything is an event in time. Everything that we bring into existence, everything that we see, everything we touch, exists in time as change. So that's where we begin with. So at a fundamental level, whatever is designed, designs. And design is an event. So design exists in time. Design is never finished until it dies. Put another way, uh, whatever is designed ontologically goes on designing in time. Design originates process. An ergonomic uh, analysis recognizes that sitting in the chair, uh, the chair designs. And what it designs is the way that we, we sit, and in time, it designs our body. So things like chairs function biophysically, biomechanically, and have consequences. Uh, and this is true of everything. everything. Uh, I'm sorry, Tony, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, yeah. We're getting some uh, sort of feedback from, uh, I think it's the microphone that you have. Is it possible yeah. to just pull out your headphone and use the computer microphone? No, but I've got one second. Can you hear me now? Oh, uh, that's perfect. Thank you so much. So sorry. All right. So um, I was just going to say, uh, everything designs. And Mar Marty, Martin Heidegger, the philosopher, put it this way, everything things. That is design designing. Cars, trains, boats, planes, hats, homes, Peter's hospitals, whatever you want to name, they design. Uh, so the next really point in relation to that, you know, is obvious. Things have consequences. Designed, designed products of design uh, create us. We are a product of design you know, from our very birth, uh, we are introduced into things in the world using a spoon to eat. Uh, learning how to walk is an instruction in design. So design becomes elemental to our becoming. But when we design, we don't necessarily think and feel that's what we're doing we don't feel that we're actually bringing people into existence when we use a tool we don't recognize that the tool is actually having an influence on our relation save between our hand and an eye uh, having a relation to us biomechanically so in using a hand tool the tool designs. So I'm making that and I'm laboring that point because it, it really underpins everything I'm going to say. So the combined consequences of this, when you bring both every human being and you bring those human beings across time, across history into resistance, has consequently produced a world within the world the world in which we exist in 
in a sense, is a double world. The biophysical world of nature and the world of our construction as it impacts on nature. And the problem is, the problem that has created our present condition is that we haven't understood what we've actually done. We know what we've made, but we don't know what we have made makes. Now, one of the fundamental principles of neglect in relation to this uh, is we're incredibly good at creation and we're incredibly bad at recognizing destruction. It's specifically in the sense that whenever we create, we also destroy. Hence, the, the environmental problems and many other problems that now define our current existence. So that throws up, um, again, a, a really fundamental challenge to design education amongst edu uh, other things. So design educators, you know, celebrate creativity, create uh, with innovation, create with inspiration. But they need to also ask, how should destruction be understood as a defining condition of the present age? Destruction is crucial to understand. Uh, is elemental to our species world making. Uh, in creating environments, we also destroy environments. So this relation between creation and destruction you know, needs to be completely embraced. Um, and it is a huge absence. So, you know, obviously, one of the most, most um, direct manifestations of this at the moment uh, is the fact that climate change is destroying ecologies and heat uh, is starting to render places of habitation uninhabitable. According to the International Panel on Climate Change, one billion people are going to be displaced by the middle of this century, by 2050. And by the end of this century, approximately 30% of the global population will have to relocate, will have been displaced. I mean, that's really difficult to grasp, not just in terms of the numbers, you know, a third of the population of the planet being displaced, but also, you know, just think in terms of the consequences you know, to human life, to the security of nations, to economies. I mean, it is gonna have a huge transformative effect on our world. It's going to make the world more dangerous, and it's already pretty dangerous. <laughs> so we have to be able to kind of bring this to the present in terms of designing in time. We have to design in anticipation to the future arriving in the present. The consequences of what I've just been talking about are already being felt. The process is already underway. So I'm just really re-emphasizing the, the point. Design is also designing us. Creation cannot be divided from destruction. Cl heat and climate change are really making many parts of the world impossible to live in and will increasingly do so. So here we come to a particular kind of place in a particular moment to Colombia now on the equator. The most 
dangerous place on the planet is going to be on either side of the equator. One of the fastest growing cities on the planet is Lagos in Nigeria. By the end of this century, it is supposed to have eight, uh, eight, um, 80 million people living in that city in the conditions that are going to be unbearable. It's not going to happen because it's going to be too hot. So, you know, really focusing back on the future and designing in time. There are three narratives that I want to put in front of you. Uh, the first one uh, is that design and the economy that we're currently in is going to decline as a result of what I've just been talking about, the impact of climate change. As a result of this, we're going to have a situation of fragmentation. And that fragmentation is going to take three dominant forms. There's going to be a huge number of the displaced, the abandoned. There's going to be a, a small percentage of people who uh, attempt to create uh, environments that are entirely technological uh, that will, as far as they're concerned, protect them from the conditions that I'm talking about. And the designing of those environments will transform them. And in terms of what is already happening, the discourse of transhumanism, you know, potentially sends them towards a transformation of the species. That's another story. But in between those two extremes uh, is the reality for the majority, which is going to be finding ways to adapt to changing circumstances. So there's the big agenda item. I'm sure you've all heard of climate adaptation, but adaptation is going to take on enormous proportions. And it is going to be the driving force of design over the remainder of this century, starting from a modest beginning. That again takes us back to uh, designing in time, uh, takes us beyond sustainability as it's currently understood, takes us towards contra practices. And contra practices are recognizing that what we have to do isn't just change what we design, but we have to transform the practice of design. And that is one practice amongst a myriad of other practices that have to be transformed. So the focus of action, of designing in time, is the transformation of practice. So that's pretty heady. Uh, and it takes us back to the fundamental understanding of sustainment. Really, sustainment is everything. Without sustainment, we have nothing. Uh, so the, the notion of sustainability as it's currently characterized in relation to sustainable design and so on is incredibly limited. Sustainment along with adaptation are the two primary imperatives of design in relation to the future. And to give this more substance, uh, I'm going to run through eight key actions that kind of really embrace uh, a transformation of design practice. Uh, and these are just a beginning. This is not a definitive characterization of the new practices, but it gives you a sense 
of them and where things can go. So the first one is destruction. Um, really, this was kind of put in a particular frame in 1947, where the scientists who created the atomic bomb, the Manhattan Project, uh, in, one, in that year, created the doomsday clock of how near the wood was to nuclear war. In 2007, climate change was added to the calculation. Uh, currently, uh, we are 90 seconds to midnight. In the year 2000, we were 100. So you can calculate how the clock is ticking down. Really the message of destruction is clear and simple and ignored. Unless we collectively destroy what threatens to destroy us and all we depend on, there won't be a future for us. This, what this puts on the agenda uh, is what I call elimination design. We need to learn how to get rid of things by design, not just bring things into existence by design. So that is a specific future practice. The next one, number two, is metrofitting. And what metrofitting says is that, particularly in relation to cities, obviously, metro, what we need to do is to deal with what already exists rather than just focus on the new. So to give a, a specific build, uh, example, a lot has been said over the years around sustainable architecture, sustainable buildings, green buildings. But a few green buildings are not going to change the city. They're gestural. Even a few sustainable cities are not going to change the impact of cities globally. The imperative is to metrofit cities. And metrofitting is just taking retrofitting up to a higher level, but not just understanding it instrumentally, not just as a mechanical exercise, but what has to be metrofitted uh, is the social fabric, the economic fabric, as well as the material fabric. So metrofitting is a big agenda item, but so is retrofitting. The third practice, the retrofitting of industries, utilities, organizational systems to reduce their impact in changing circumstances. So uh, the, the, the way in which we manage water, uh, for example, has to dramatically change in the conditions that are now emerging. We can't leave water unprotected. We can't just let it be taken away through evaporation. So, you know, the protection of water, you know, becomes uh, one example of the systemic design transformation. Uh, healthcare is another practice uh, that is going to have to be transformed. At the moment, in Pakistan, they're, they're experiencing a major health crisis just through people becoming sick from heat. So the relation between heat and health has to be addressed in relation to retrofitting that links back to something like metrofitting in terms of we have to create environments that protect people from heat for the sake of their health. 
Number four, repairing. Everything that we make needs to be made in a way that enables it to be repaired. Over time, the ability for things to be repaired has diminished. So repairing needs to become an eth ethos, but at the same time, people have to learn how to repair. So in terms of our education, the, the ethos of repairing needs to be something which becomes inculcated in the way in which we learn and act. And again, it isn't just repairing things mechanically. It is repairing things socially, in, in a sense, even kind of spiritually, in terms of the values and the cosmologies that we function within. Number five, I already mentioned, adaptation. This is uh, a kind of a vast area, a, a great expanse that kind of envelops what I've already said, all the other practices and more. So in a sense, it becomes a sensibility in relation to becoming future. It becomes something that becomes an integral way of seeing and thinking and acting. Adaptation has to become a particular kind of consciousness and practice. Number six, and there are just a few more. Number six is relearning. Education as a paradigm, it, it so often now is education for the past rather than the future. Many of the practices which are being taught are actually redundant. The, the conditions that we're talking about are rendering the way that we bring the world into existence at the moment redundant. So again, just using the word of sustainability and bringing it to education, characterized as sustainment. It isn't just a question of adding more stuff to the curriculum called sustainability. It is about actually completely reviewing and transforming the curriculum. So sustainment is a driving force of knowledge permeating all disciplines. Number seven is dewarring. Dewarring means designing against war. You know, we are teetering on the edge of destruction at this moment. And as the conditions that I'm describing continue, the world becomes more dangerous as borders collapse through people being displaced in huge numbers and crossing borders to find ways of surviving elsewhere that is more amenable, less exposed to the ravages of climate change. You know, that's a recipe for a huge amount of conflict. So the act of warring, the act of the prevention of conflict, again, it has to be a massive agenda. And clearly a lot of this goes beyond the design, it goes beyond design practice, but at the same time, advocacy needs to come from design. You know, I've spent a lot of time working on the relation between design and politics and, and the situation that we're in, uh, you know, drive design towards being a, a political activity uh, because design is an instrument of change and circumstances are forcing us, if we are gonna take responsibility for the, for the future to change. So again, design and politics, dewarring is a kind of an indivisible trio. And then finally, reimagining. Uh, imagination, you know, demands that we, that we really 
embrace the reconceptualization of so much imagination isn't something that simply spills out of us. Imagination, in a sense, is a response to the world. It comes from the world. We, we see something and we imagine it to be other than it appears. We acquire knowledge and we imagine through the capability of the revelation of that knowledge. So, in order to be able to address the things I'm talking about, in order to be able to address the future, we have to put ourselves in a position to imagine how things will be, how to respond to them, how to train to change our circumstances. So, to kind of pull this together and to wind down, obviously what I'm talking about is unbelievably hard. It's really, really difficult. Sustainment is a huge challenge. The challenge that we face is great. But one of the things that becomes apparent when you kind of reflect upon history is that if you look back in the past and then project forward to the future, many things that would have seemed completely and totally impossible in the past are realized. So the definition of impossibility is defined by the knowledge that you have at the time. In other words, if you change what you know, what becomes possible also changes. So I'm very aware of everything I've said, you know, rest in, in terms of you take any notice, in terms of whether you view what I've said with credibility, whether you think I'm just saying this, whether it's just more verbiage. So I want to kind of end by just uh, telling you what I do. Uh, I just want to kind of emphasize that I'm not just presenting these things from a kind of, uh, if you like, a dark idealism, but rather they are things which direct my life. So I do various things. You know, when, I'm, when I was talking about the imperative of contra practice, changing practices, at the moment, I'm working with my colleague, Domini Pereira, at the Bauhaus University of Germany, on a book on contra practice, which is going to arrive next year. But I'm also working on projects informed by contra practice. Specifically, I'm working on the relocation of communities at risk in terms of climate impacts. I'm working with a group on a national strategy for relocation in Australia. Um, at the moment, um, we're just completing a website. We're completing a, a paper that is directed towards policy makers. Uh, we have an exhibition next March. So we're trying to kind of bring the notion of relocation uh, into much higher profile in this country. And in terms of that, you know, the practicalities of relocating communities is something that I've worked on. I worked on a relocation of a city in Sweden in 2009. Uh, I've worked on two uh, examples around uh, two existing cities, one a new city and one uh, an argument for relocating a city in Australia. Uh, at the same time, you know, recognizing that practices in these kind of areas have to be transformed and we need methodologies to do this. 
in a my recent book on writing design fiction to relocating a city in crisis, actually presents a methodology of how you address a really complex problem. Uh, I've written a book on uh, remaking cities and metrofitting. And I've also written a book on, on staging war. So in relation to that, I've also had contact and dialogue with people in the defense forces. So what I'm really saying is very simple. What I try to do uh, is to think and register what I think by what I write and then use what I write to direct what I do. That's it. Thank you for giving me your attention. And uh, if there's time for questions, I'm keen to answer them. Thank you so much, Tony. I appreciate that. Um, I think what we'll do is I'll remove your spotlight so we can see some of the audience. Yeah. And uh, and I'll say that, uh, so the Q&A and the chat are both available for questions, if anyone has any. Um, I, will let them, uh, I will let them populate those things. Um, but hearing you speak, Tony, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you here. I'm sorry, let me turn my camera back on. Um, so I, I have this conversation with my students all the time about uh, the notion of de-iteration. Right. So if design is iterative, what does it mean to sort of unwind design by de-iteration? And hearing you talk just made me think about how we might and should be training a new generation of designers to do yeah. this. Like, what are the key skills that we think our students need to have in order to both understand the the, the potential futures that we're trying to create and uh, to understand where we can actually sort of remove the uh, the most dangerous parts of those futures? Okay, uh, I've got a cluster of responses to that, okay? The first is that uh, you can't design really responsibly unless you understand the world in which you design. So I think there has to be a kind of a reconfiguration uh, of learning about the world uh, being a much larger part of design education and the actual how to design activity being reduced, which links to another development in terms of AI, because AI is going to displace a lot of that how to activity. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, that's going to kind of represent a kind of a loss, a, a diminishment. Uh, and what I see as replacing that uh, is elevating the significance of strategic design and social design uh, in a far more developed way in relation to worldly circumstances. So the implication of that um, is design has to be more directive in a, in a film, filmic sense, rather than simply a, a kind of a more focused, one-dimensional creative act activity. So I see over the next, say, 20 years, design changing quite dramatically. And rather than design changing by people taking notice of the kind of things I and others say in relation to the form of its future, the transformation of design is going to be transformed by being driven by changing circumstances. It's going to change whether you like it or not. Okay, thank you, Tony. Hey. Uh, Tony? Some... Yeah? Tony? Hi, Tony. This is Cecilia. How are you? Um, I'm good. And you? I am fine. So uh, I would like to 
to say, that's a pity that you are not here. Because, you know, when we enter the main campus, uh, there is uh, a plate that says, it's kind of a banner that says, formalización laboral inmediata para los docentes ocasionales. Okay, tu, tu comprendes lo que dice? Uh, do you understand or you want I translate? I think you should translate to everybody, yeah. You want I translate that into yeah. English? Yeah. Okay, it says well, la, uh, the formalization, the, uh, the labor formalization, the immediately labor formalization for professors, for temporary professors. So uh, I want to say that there is a very deep engagement of students in this campus, in this university. And all the walls here, uh, we can read a little bit about the history of their struggle for their rights. It's absolutely amazing. So uh, because you are doing a project on counter practice, I think this is a very emblematic space of counter practice. Um, that's it, Tony. It's just, a, it's just a little comment. It would be great to have you here uh, working with the students. And thank you so much to be together. Love you, Tony. Bye. Thank you. I think that I think there's a a, a really as a vacuum for students uh, in that so much of education is been driven towards instrumental ends. Uh, in a sense, the space for exploration for the student has diminished. And the, the situation I'm talking about requires exploration, experimentation, investigation, rather than conformity. Uh, so one of the things that I always tell students is just don't do what you're told. I'll leave it at that. Thank think you. For yourself. Think for yourself. Uh, we have a question here in uh, the the Q and A. Um, so, uh, Victor would like to know your feeling about cities and whether or not cities are inherently unsustainable, uh, or whether or not they can contribute to the sustainment, um, or if we need new ways of thinking about cities. Yes, I, I mean I've already said in relation to what I said about metrofitting that we have to think about cities in a new way to make them other than they are. I mean, over half the world's population lives in cities, so we have to deal with them. It isn't a question of thinking cities are good or bad. They are here, people live in them, and they have to be transformed. So the question is, what forces of transformation can be created? Uh, and you know, that is the whole agenda of metrofitting. Uh, and it can't be reduced to just a set of practices and principles that, are, again, are just uh, in, instrumental. You can't, in a sense, divide the form of the economy from the city, from the nature of the city. So if you're going to change the city, you have to be able to change the economy as well. Uh, equally, uh, one of the ways that cities have been created have actually fractured and uh, disabled community. So one of the ways of transforming the city is not simply to address the bricks and mortar, but to address the cultural and social fabric of the city because if you change that, that will start to change everything. So that comes back to what I said about, you know, social design being 
a really significant part of the future of design education and practice beyond the way it's taught at the moment, you know, to become a far more uh, significant and in all embracing uh, way of thinking about the function of design, design, understanding design as a social process of human transformation. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that answer, Tony. Um, one more from uh, the Q&A. So in addition to political leaders and political groups, can you suggest other non-designer communities that you feel urgently need to learn the topics that you're talking about? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, in a way, um, we need as people with a relation to design, uh, to be able to kind of introduce uh, the kind of way I'm talking and thinking about design as it affects everybody into the kind of the social relations that we have in, in all the kind of dimensions of our lives. So that, uh, you know, the way in which uh, we deal with food, you know, the way in which we constitute a way of life and all the groups that, you know, really result from those kinds of activities. So, you know, how do you introduce, as an open question, how do you introduce design into your social relations? You know, uh, how do you think about design in relation to uh, the other kind of uh, communities in which you interact? Uh, so it's not really thinking about design as it kind of arrives in that fetishized and representational form uh, through its existing forms of representation. But in a sense, it's taking the lid off design and seeing it at that fundamental level that I've been talking about in relation to creation and destruction. So you can translate that into whatever you do. I mean, you're cooking a meal. That meal is a product of destruction and it's a product of creation. And it throws up, as in every instance, a kind of an ethical question. An ethical question always arises: is, does what I've destroyed, is what I've destroyed justified? And we destroy in a way that we are aware of the consequences. Well, first, I want to ask to thank you. And I want to ask you, what do you think about the virtual reality? like the metaverse for future design? The metaverse, you say? Yes. Well, I think that um, the kind of way in which we see complexity and the way that we see time uh, has to be brought into alignment with the conditions that, that I've been talking about. So uh, we've expanded in a, in a sense in our capability technologically to communicate, but we've shrunken in terms of our ability to communicate. Uh, because a lot of communication, you know, depends on a condition of intimacy, depends on a condition of empathy, depends on a condition of that, exchange. Uh, so the scale of which we really exist and function 
um, has become part of what I've talked about in relation to fragmentation. So really, uh, the way in which we think about space and time goes back to what I was saying about redundancy. The way in which we've inherited this thinking no longer coincides with the condition of our existence. And the way in which the future uh, is projected uh, is never sufficiently inclusive. So that we can't talk about kind of a, a universal or a, a meta future because of the inequity, the unevenness of our condition of existence. So when I talk about the displacement of a billion people, the billion people that are gonna be displaced are the poorest and the most vulnerable. They don't exist in a metaverse. They exist in a kind of a raw reality of inequity. I, I have a, I have a question. Um, I have worked uh, with uh, simulation modeling in the past and uh, designing futures, and yeah. inevitably our predictions are faulty. So if we are doing designing for the future, how are we going to have a sense of what the consequences of that design are going to be, especially as you put the design designs us, and we yeah. are be, going to be different, and we cannot fully and know ahead of time how that difference will be. Does this mean that your emphasis should be on the things like the retrofitting and the re repairing and those aspects that are happen more closely in the cycle of adaptation? Yeah. So um, obviously we, we can't see the future, but you know, we have to be able to kind of lift up our eyes in terms of look at where we're going. So, uh, which really means that we have to predict and correct. Mm -hmm. So, that, so uh, the, you know, the, the reference earlier on to kind of iterative change, we have to have a kind of an iterative relation to guiding ourselves towards the future rather than having a kind of a notion of a a fixed path towards a particular destination which we've designated as what the future is going to be like. Which coming back to chart the time is to recognize that time doesn't actually function in the linear way which we are so familiar mm -hmm. with. That the future is actually traveling towards us as we travel towards it. What we've done uh, is thrown so much into the future. I mean, climate change is a very kind of graphic example. It, 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 it comes to us as a result of what has been thrown into the future from the past and the present. You know, it has hundreds of years of previous emissions and current emissions. Uh, and the consequence of that is kind of arriving in the present. And that kind of characterization can be applied to other things. Uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that there isn't a kind of a universal future. As I was saying in terms of the previous question, the future is differential according to your circumstances in the world. So we don't all exist in the same time. We exist in differential time according to our place and our circumstances uh, and our economic situation and so on. So uh, it is really helpful to spend time on time, you know, to really develop for yourself a kind of a more 
complex understanding of time in relation to spatial, cultural, and economic difference. I think another thing you're implying there is that the designer, or all of us actually, need to approach the situation with more humility and not try and break grandiose things, but be willing to work in little bits effectively. Yeah, yes. I mean, I think that uh, modesty, uh, you know, in, in a sense, you could say is a key word, not just in terms of how we work, but how we live uh, and how we actually relate materially to the world. Thank you. Thanks. Eh, uh, buenos días. ¿Está prendido? Sí, me escuchan. Eh, qué pena, no, no, no estoy en condiciones de, de hacerla en inglés. Eh, por favor, eh, el profesor ha hablado de una eh, de reparación y de remodelación, no solamente en, en términos mecánicos, sino sociales y espirituales. Eh, cuando él habla de esa remodelación espiritual, eh, se está re refiriendo a esa, una inversión de los valores éticos, estéticos, o, una, o un revertimiento de esos valores éticos y estéticos que siempre han sido los mismos para el ser humano. Los valores del ser humano, no, no, no como se dice ahorita, son relativos al espacio y al tiempo. Creo que son los mismos y justamente la crisis viene porque se ha perdido o se han eh, invertido esos valores. Eh, me gustaría que me aclarara un poquito sobre eso. Muchas gracias, profesor. Yeah, gracias. Um... Pero, uh, refiero por mí, uh, hablo. Uh, so, okay. Um, can you all still hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. I believe Bogota. Yeah, so, uh, can, can somebody translate a little bit of that? No, I will try. I will try. I think that the idea is what is the relation, relation with spiritual change and ethics? Yeah. So, I mean, I think I've already said that the, the change uh, has to be, first of all, a change with us. Uh, and that change with us uh, has to be a change of the way in which we act, the, the change in which way that we think, uh, and the way in which we constitute values through our thinking and action. So to put this in a, a very concise way, the circumstances that are emerging require that we constitute a different kind of cosmology. So what happens is that the way that we're brought up, the culture which we're introduced to and adopt, brings a cosmology with it, a way of understanding the world, ourselves and our actions in that world. So a cosmology isn't something that we have a theoretical understanding of, but it's something that is manifest through our actions, through our practices. So when I am talking about the transformation of practice, the creation of contra practice, by implication, that implies a transformation of our cosmology, a transformation of the world that we bring into existence recognizing what I said at the beginning, is that everything that we in existence by design, designs us. So we cannot continue to exist as we are in the world that is emerging. So one of the discourses that is now being developed is now being talked about is around cosmotechnics, a different way of understanding 
technology in relation to cosmology. So again, all that one can say in talking about these things is that a place to begin can be identified. And the act of commencing that beginning uh, really is an individual task that we have to be able to embrace and attempt to collectivize. Uh, thank you, Tony. I want to be respectful of your time. It's four minutes past the hour right now. Uh, we do have a yep. few more questions in the in the Q and A, um, but if you uh, need to go, then please uh, feel feel free to do so. So for, for me, it's uh, two a.m. in the morning <laughs> in Tasmania. So well, if I'm if I'm not as sharp as I'd like to be, you can understand why. Uh, well, we we doubly appreciate you joining us then. Um, and uh, then I suppose I will let you go to sleep uh, and um, we can hold the other questions uh, for some other time. No, no, no. If, if anybody's got a question, uh, I'm happy to, I mean, no, I don't want to kind of let the opportunity of the question disappear if there's anybody got a, a question. Okay, in that case, uh, Dan, would you like to ask uh, Tony your question from the chat? You can just unmute and do so. Sure, thanks. Um, so I'll just read what I wrote. Um, are, are you concerned that uh, totalizing uh, techno-utopian visions for the future, um, so I'm talking about um, visions being promulgated by influential people um, about how to um, uh, solve sustainability and and um, you know make make the the world sustainable for everyone um, but but visions that are uh, very totalizing and in many ways empty um, are you concerned that the the influence of these ideas will pre preempt the large scale work needed to re reimagine in more productive ways. Um, and, and if so, what are your thoughts on how these kinds of movements can be resisted? Okay, so that kind of opens up a kind of a can of worms. Um, the situation is, from my perspective, um, that there are there is a particular technocentric uh, sector of human society that, that are kind of characterized through the notion of accelerationists, okay? So accelerationism uh, is predicated upon a speeding towards singularity of the complete domination of technology in relation to our being. Uh, and it kind of links to what I was saying earlier on uh, in relation to a minority looking towards technological salvation. So first of all, there is no kind of capability of delivering a, a global uniform condition to the entire world. Uh, the differences uh, are enormous. The resources are limited and there is no means of imposition. Uh, so we're past a condition our projections of utopias. Uh, in a sense, we are in a dystopic condition uh, which demands to be improved and the key to it, as I've indicated, is adaptation. But adaptation 
isn't towards a uniform condition. Adaptation is something that takes place in the conditions in which you exist. Uh, so the aspiration to improve the conditions of life on this planet obviously has to remain, but it has to be kind of tempered by what is possible in the conditions that are unfolding. So we are technological beings in so far as you know, technology has made us in the world that we now occupy. Um, and technology is going to be indivisible from our future. But it isn't necessarily the form of technology that accelerationism is promotion. You know, Elon Musk is not the future. Uh, and uh, it, there is a kind of a, a danger in what is happening. Uh, because what is happening is also a political transformation that, that there, there are a community of powerful entrepreneurs who actually see themselves uh, as political leaders of the world, of, of corporate governance being a form of national and global, global governance. So, you know, that, that is another one of the dangers that we are going to have to contend with. 